Welcome to Be Inspired. I'm sat here with Jay Patel, General Manager at Cisco and former CEO of IMI Mobile. Hi, Jay. How are you doing? I'm really well, Neil. Jay, um, we're going to talk about IMI Mobile today. Tell us about the journey. Where did the company start? How did you get involved? Um, so I got involved initially as a VC. And um, so I, what IMI Mobile does is we provide the software and infrastructure for large consumer businesses to communicate with their customers. It's something that we all recognize today. So when you get a message from your bank or the logistics provider, um, or you're having a chatbot experience um, with a service provider, there's technology behind that. And we provide the cloud infrastructure and software that does that service. And we do it at scale across um, the UK and the US. Um, I got involved initially as a VC. Um, you know, we invested you know, essentially Series A money or even seed money um, mm -hmm. into, into a, a couple of founders. And the business grew really well for the first five, six, seven years. We'd, we worked with a lot of telecom operators. Um, and, then, and then the iPhone came along. And, and, and people today may not quite recognize the impact the iPhone had. Right. And, and the impact the iPhone had was actually the carriers or the operators who used to be the um, um, kind of wall gardens of the mobile internet yeah. were no longer the wall gardens. And so the business had to go through a pivot. And so I got more involved as a VC as the business went through a pivot. Um, and then we actually changed our focus on who our target customers were um, in about, about 10, 12 years ago. And that's when I got more operationally involved and um, I finally you know, I became the CEO um, a, a year before the IPO. We had grown like I said, very rapidly from about 2005 to 2010. And then growth started slowing off a bit as we went through that pivot. Mm -hmm. And as the carriers became less important, um, so, you know, as we were looking ultimately for an exit, right, cause right. Some, because some of the uh, investors had been in five plus years, seven plus years, eight plus years. Sure. And, and we know how, you know, um, and fund cycles can be 10 years. Right. Um, so when we were looking for, the, for an exit, we um, started looking at a trade sale, uh, mm -hmm. like you do. Would have got some value, but maybe not maximized value. Um, we were also looking at um, a PE recap of the, of, of the early venture investors. Sure. Um, and then also, um, we threw an IPO into the ring, um, and that was, the, that was where, we, where we ended up. And how did you convince everyone around the table to think about an IPO in London, particularly on AIM? Um, well, at the time, I think, again, I, um, I'm not sure um, rational investors actually at times need convincing of any particular route. I think, right. I think in general, investors can be very, uh, very mercantile and basically maximize value. That's what they're mm -hmm. there for. So, so what we ended up doing was we ended up looking at an essentially dual tracking processes sure. where we, we had prepared essentially for a trade sale to a P house or, or trade. Yeah. And we were running that process with an investment bank. At the same time, we thought, well, maybe if that either doesn't work or to get the value that we wanted, mm -hmm. um, we could have an IPO in our back pocket or at least have the option. Sure. Um, we were quite lucky in those days of having the IPO markets open up just a bit. So mm -hmm. um, we did our preparations and you know, had some term sheets from PE. Right. Um, and, and then it was either that or um, um, an AIM listing. And you know, as a management team, um, there are certain advantages to being um, on, uh, on on the public market versus being you know, part of a PE process, and also for selling investors, mm. because again, one of the things that um, we had is we had some funds that needed to exit, sure, and we had some funds that were happy to roll and carry on. Right, um, management teams that could see that there was still some way to go yeah. in the business. Um, so, how do you you know marrying all those different objectives? different timelines um, is, is easiest in an IPO versus um, a 100% trade sale or, or P recap. Right. And w were you ready to become a public company CEO at that point? Um, well, I'd been on the public company board since about 2003. So, so, right. so I'd been on the PLC board on, on a couple of companies before then. So I was very much aware of the rules of some of the institutional shareholders um, and I was, you know, aware that, um, you know, the junior market, particularly the AIM market, yeah. um, is is regulated, but not overly so. 
right? Mm -hmm. So therefore, you know, there's, there's obviously you know, rules, regs, takeover panel, there's lots of things that you need to know. But at the same time, um, I felt as if I was, I was fully aware of the, of, of the, um, the consequences of being uh, uh, um, listed. Um, and, I, and I was comfortable with it. So therefore, um, you know, it, it wasn't such a big step. Um, sure. At the same time, I think, um, you know, if you've got faith in your business and, you, and you've got faith in your numbers and it's a, it's a good, solid business, um, I think, you know, yeah, no one should be yeah, that worried about it. And talk us through that profile. What sort of revenues did you have? I remember. Yeah, so, 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 so we, were, we were a um, a business that had a lot of, I'd say, recurring kind of revenue, which mm -hmm. is also a, a good thing for being on the public market. Um, so we were about, I think, 35 million of revenue, six, seven million pounds of, of EBITDA. We raised 30 million pounds, but actually 22 of that went out to the selling shareholders. Right. Um, and only eight actually came okay. into the business. Mm -hmm. um, we then a year later did an, a secondary placing. Right. Um, so managed to get the selling shareholders who wanted to get out out. They made money on the investment, so they were happy. Sure. Um, the management team um, uh, secured um, additional share options over a period of time. Right. So, 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 so they were happy, and the investors that wanted to stay stayed, and they sold out subsequently at a much higher value. So I think, and basically all the stakeholders at the at the end of it were happy. Brilliant. Brilliant. So. 2014, DeepMind has just been sold to Google. Yep. Yep. Um, you, know, you had uh, Grubhub go public in the States yep. in April yep. and yep. Just Eat same, same week yep. here. You yep. guys IPO'd in June. Yep. Yep. And I think you kind of opened the market here. I remember there being a few other tech IPOs yep. like Crossrider that came afterwards. What, what, sort of, um, what did you do from that point on? Um, well, um, again, but by virtue of being listed, yeah. uh, and by virtue of kind of, in some ways, you, know, you get stability by um, being listed because you're not necessarily then in, in some cases in the P situation for example you might already have your eyes on the next exit sure. uh, you know uh, um, you know in in public markets you've now got to hit whatever expectations you've set yeah. um, it, it's um, it's great that the you're allowed to get on with running the business right which I think is one of the biggest advantages of being listed so we could just get on and run the business um, we acquired in those two, three years of post IPO, at least four or five businesses, you know, for you know, valuations between five and 15 to 20 million um, pounds. So that was like Text Local. Text and... Local, that was a business called Archer, a business called Infracast, mm -hmm. um, that essentially allowed us to consolidate, and now a company called Healthcare Communications, to consolidate our position in the UK market. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we, we got ourselves in the position of the UK market where I could genu genuinely guarantee that everybody in any room that had a message that we had processed in the last week, right? So, uh, you know, we we became number one in the UK. Sure, Mr. Uh, Shah, you're late for your appointment. Yeah, you, Mr. Shah, you're late for your appointment, you're behind on your bills. <laughs> um, you know um, me too um, well. Uh, yeah, um, but, um, you, know, um, you know, we worked with, and through the acquisitions, managed to consolidate a market. And again, I think, you know, one of the, one of the um, advantages of being a listed company is, mm -hmm is once you get out of all the preference stacks and all the stacks that you have in, in venture capital, yeah. you have ordinary shares. Right. And, and they have a value and you can trade them. Um, and we were able to um, pay for cash and then add share compensation as part of a, a, a deal, some earn out uh, as, as part of the deal. Um, and you know, that allowed us to acquire good entrepreneur-led businesses. Um, mm -hmm. You know, most of the entrepreneurs stayed for two, three years post acquisition, sure. um, and we really made made a good business out of uh, out of out of doing that kind of work. Um, we then also used that foundation to go to the US, um, right. and that was um, you know, that, was, that was more of a leap, mm -hmm. um, uh, um, um, but obviously uh, yeah, it, it was successful in the end. Do you wish you had gone to the US earlier? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I mean hindsight's always easy to say, <laughs> shoulda, woulda, coulda. We were very tentative in our first steps in the US. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, one of the things, again, about the technology markets particularly, which I know, um, you know a lot of technology um, um, uh, people look at listing, um, is they are global in nature. Sure. And by virtue, especially of SaaS, cloud businesses being global in nature, yeah. um, you know, sometimes you're in that situation where you are either going to have to make it in the US or, or get eaten, right? So it, you, right. You, you don't have much choice. Um, and you know, we decided that when we looked around the market, that our technology platform was as good as anybody's out there, yeah. uh, including the US players. 
and therefore let's go and you know play in their yard rather right. than you know, rather than wait for them to come here. Um, one of the other things which I think is very interesting. Again, I know you may have some um, um, UK um, software CEOs or people looking at this uh, podcast or listening in. Is we may underestimate that if we work for a large UK PLC as one of our clients yes. or, or a handful of them, they push us pretty hard to create really good software. There's a lot of companies in the US who would love to have that software, right? And you know, don't in some ways don't believe the hype of Silicon Valley. Yeah. and how good their tech is, because they've scaled it in a large market. I think if we take some of our best software to the US, I think that the, you, you've got the same possibilities, uh, because you know, we've, typically, we've, t- we've typically had to operate at a high pace in the UK. So therefore, when we went to the US, and we now have the likes of Best Buy and Walmart, and some of the big banks there, sure. had we got there earlier, maybe we, we would have been bigger or whatever, but um, mm-hmm. in the end, um, you know, one of the things that we in the UK, I think, are probably more careful with in general is capital. Sure. Right? Definitely. right. So, you know, we kind of, um, you know, we raised some capital, went there. Could we have raised more and gone harder? Probably. But, um, right. yeah. But I'm yeah. glad you touched on that because yeah. there's probably a lot of CEOs out there with a bit of imposter syndrome looking out to the valley, looking at some of these companies that raised you know, hundreds of millions of VC dollars yeah. um, that are competing with. Yeah. Um, but you know, the UK is a great testing ground for. The UK like is a great testing ground, and and, mm-hmm. and also, don't believe the hype on the hundreds of million of dollars. Often it's just wasted in right. in needless go to market things that don't work, um, mm-hmm. and actually, having a focus approach, with a great product though. I mean, I mean the product's got to be good. Um, I think um, can you, know, you, you, you can punch above your weight for sure. Yeah. And they, they say that good companies are not enough. It's got to be a good investment for investors as well. And yep. meeting all those expectations is is key. Yep. Um, t- tell me, how did you meet Mike? Because I thought you and um, Mike Jeffries, your CFO, were yep. a great double act. And uh, yeah, yep. I remember coming along to your results presentations and uh, it got a little boring, Jay, right? <laughs> He's like, you know, we're going to do this and we're going to hit the numbers yep. and you, you um, delivered. We, we were partly yeah. also lucky because we had a great, we have a great business, great business model. Mike, I met through an acquisition that, that we'd made when we, when we did the pivot right. in 2010. One of the other things about being, uh, being listed is I think the relationship between the CEO and the FD is so important. Right. right? You really do need to somehow kind of work you're very closely together, mm-hmm. uh, particularly as you know, you need to obviously set the right expectations. You need somebody there that um, is not the CEO, but is gonna hold the CEO to account on whatever we're telling the city, whatever you're telling right. investors. I do think that it's that relationship, and therefore, you know, again, if there's CEOs out there or FDs looking at it, you know, you've gotta make sure that's a very solid foundation on, on which you build a business. Great, so great story, international business, double digit growth. How many acquisitions did you do in total? Um, I think we did about seven or eight. I, I looked at it the other day and I said, basically we raised Roughly, a hundred million pounds of either primary or secondary cap- capital, yeah. uh, or primary or, or secondary placings, and then roughly did about a hundred million pounds worth of deals, about seven deals. Wow. Yeah, I think uh, for me one of the other things about um, using the capital markets because I, yeah. I, I think fundamentally, um, it's not people forget the, the, a listing's not an exit, a listing's not. Um, you know, it's 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 a capital market, sure. <laughs> um, and you are there to raise capital. Um, you're in com- in competition with other people trying to raise capital and existing companies that also have shareholders. So you've got to kind of look at it from the perspective of, of why are you doing, it. and you have a very clear vision yeah. of why you're listing and what the purpose is of your business and 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 what story you you need to get, tell investors to get capital. And what we basically always realized that because we were a cloud technology software business, that it is global in nature, that yeah. at some point it, it, it would consolidate. The market would consolidate and either we would be the consolidator or we would be consolidated. And I think that once we went to the US, it was very apparent to me that we had a great potential for our software. Um, you know, the product was great, um, customers loved it, but we needed a lot more feet on the street, right? So you needed a lot more salespeople in order to be the number one. Um, sure. um, and um, so we were out there, we were looking at acquisitions. We were also then meeting, you know, the big players in, you know, the big tech players in the, in the US, mm-hmm. um, you know, trying to become part of their ecosystems. Um, so again, if you look at everybody from Microsoft to Oracle to Salesforce to, to Cisco to everybody, they've all got huge ecosystems around them in the US. Right. 
lots of partner networks, a lot of ISV partners. Um, and once you understand that game over there, you kind of get, you, you kind of feel as if you've, you've got to somehow be in the in, in one of their ecosystems. And at some totally point, um, you're the product they want to put on the, put into their into into their distribution. Yeah. And you know we um, you know got ourselves into a position where um, um, Cisco were looking at strengthening some of their product set. I mean, they've obviously got a huge distribution, and that's how it kind of you know it happened. There were a number of potential buyers of the business. You know, we managed to get a you know I think it was a fifty percent premium, a sixty percent premium on the you know the, on the weighted average price for the previous six months. So it added a cash deal. So sure. So you know ultimately it, it was a very good deal for the shareholders. Fantastic. Yep. Jay, I know hundreds of CEOs, but few do I know who have stayed on with the acquirer for as long as you've done. You yeah. talked about having feet on the street. Yeah. Is that what's still driving you today? I think ultimately the responsibility of, of, of CEOs or founders or anybody in any situation is to make sure that whatever they've created um, endures. Yeah. Right? You know, there's, there's a lot of situations where um, companies crumble after they've been sold, so many. or things go wrong. There's a, there's a lot of stuff, and, and 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 it's not something which you know myself and my colleagues, um, you know, we've you know, so both of my colleagues are also still there. Um, you know, I, I've probably retained 95% plus of, of the entire senior management team. Um, um, you know, with with my team at Cisco, uh, um, and you know, I think that you know, for me, it's about making sure that even in 10 years or 20 years time from now. Um, that I could sit around and go, hey, that little piece of software that's powering some part of the US or something, right. you know, we're somewhere in the middle of that. You know, I mean, we created something of software and my, me and my team. That, that, that would be a, a tick in the box beyond all the fin financial measures. Um, so making sure you embed something in the organization that you're selling to was also a goal. Um, so that's why we're, we're still there, yeah. That's hugely inspiring. Thanks so much, Jay. Good to talk to you.